good morning, everyone. Right before the big start of the holiday season, which is soon upon us. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Gary Greenswig, and uh, Dr. McGinn um, is not available to be with us this morning. So I'm going to start us off, and uh, Dr. Ankita Sagar is going to lead our panel as we um, uh, get through our presentation. And um, uh, this is quite timely. Um, I think there's not a uh, a news event that I don't watch on television or um, uh, an article in the paper every day about respiratory illness in adults and children. And certainly um, RSV is at the top of the list uh, for children along with flu and uh, in some cases COVID. And so we um, uh, reached out uh, to Dr. Flor uh, Munoz from the um, uh, uh, Baylor College of Medicine, and uh, we um, are going to have a great conversation about RSV this morning. We thank everyone for um, joining us. Um, before I start, I would just like to do some formal introductions. First, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Munoz, who is an associate professor of pediatrics and infectious disease at the Baylor College of Medicine and director of the Transplant Infectious Disease Program at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. Um, she's a clinician investigator with several um, uh, various projects supported by the NIH, the CDC, and I believe this is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Is that, I, I thought PMGF, okay, I have it, um, uh, or other industries. Uh, she focuses on vaccine, the epidemiology of respiratory infections in healthy and immunocompromised uh, hosts, and the evaluation of safety and immunogenicity of vaccines in pregnant women, children, and transplant recip recipients. She's published extensively on topics related to influenza, RSV, vaccines, and maternal immunization. And as you can imagine, uh, we're fortunate to have her as she, uh, her, she is on the circuit currently talking about RSV everywhere. So, so welcome and, and thank you so much. Um, the next persons on our panel, I wanna mention are all part of the um, Common Spirit Health Ambulatory um, uh, Pediatrics uh, Collaborative, a, a group that uh, has come together over the last year and a half, um, uh, prodded by, um, uh, Dr. Walsh and Dr. Pararodi to say, we need to do something for the pediatricians. So we're very happy to have this group. And um, Dr. Dudas and Dr. Walsh and uh, Lilia are part of our steering committee and Sarah Fahim. And I'll start with Sarah. It, Dr. Fahim is um, a, a, a member of the um, uh, collaborative. And so um, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Fahim is the pediatric department chair and chair at Dominican Hospital in Santa Cruz. Um, she does a combination of inpatient and outpatient um, pediatric care. She attended school at the St. Uh, attended medical school at the St. George's University School of Medicine and completed her residency at Children's Hospital of New Jersey um, at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. Um, Dr. Walsh, who is uh, my neighbor in Northern California, about an hour and 40 minutes apart, um, uh, has practiced uh, as a general pediatrician in Sacramento for 31 years. She's been with the Mercy Medical Group there for 18 years. They are part of our Medical Practice Foundation. She served as the Mercy Medical Group um, uh, Chair of Women and Children's Service Lines for the last eight years and is the Regional Medical Director for Pediatrics in Northern California for Dignity Health. And Dr. Uh, Lilia Pararodi is the academic um, uh, Chair for Pediatrics for the Dignity Health Medical Group in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. She is the uh, Chair and Professor of Pediatrics for uh, um, the Creighton University School of Medicine campus in Phoenix, uh, and she is a member of the um, Physician Enterprise Ambulatory Pediatric Work Group. And her daughter was just married last weekend. So, uh, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Michael Dudas is a general pediatrician and chief of pediatrics at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health. Uh, he's completed his medical school um, uh, training at the University of Pittsburgh and pediatric residency at the University of Washington. So welcome to uh, Dr. Munoz and our panel, uh, John and Brooke, thank you for helping us get this all put together. And so Dr. Munoz, I think we'll turn it over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. So, so yes, thank you for um, having the chance to discuss this topic. We will focus today on RSV, but 
I have to say um, it has been a very timely topic to talk about for several months already. And as we will see, we are um, having uh, some discussions regarding what to do at this point. So we'll talk about disease epidemiology management and prevention of RSV. These are some of my disclosures. As you've heard, I'm involved in a number of research projects and activities related to vaccines. And uh, the objectives of this morning, um, as I mentioned, is to really take a quick look at the epidemiology of the multiple respiratory viruses that we are seeing this season, but focus on RSV and uh, talk about uh, management guidelines and prevention strategies. This is uh, where I sit here at the Texas Medical Center and Texas Children's Hospital within the Medical Center in Houston. So here we are. Um, the long anticipated, I would say, tridemic has uh, begun. And this is really something that we thought would happen from the beginning of the pandemic. We have had challenges with SARS-CoV-2 and we see how so variants of the Omicron um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 continue to emerge and they're circulating at now in December higher levels than what they were just a few months ago. This is after we had already a, a summer um, little outbreak. Influenza season began very early this year and today it has already reached the highest levels of cases that we have seen since the 2009 influenza pandemic. And RSV depending on where you are, has already overwhelmed our healthcare systems here in the South in Texas since the summer. We started to have RSV in May again this year, and we are seeing RSV spread throughout the country worsening this fall. We have seen a couple of alerts coming out from the CDC uh, earlier in November, one talking about this very high activity of viruses, and then more recently, uh, just this week actually, um, the guidance regarding what to do because we are running out of antivirals for influenza and there's been hard to get them. So more information coming about that. <clears throat> so what I wanted to show you here is really um, that um, if you look at the whole period from the pandemic, this is inform information from the National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance System that is coming out of the CDC. You look from March 2020 until November 2022, the activity of different viruses. The line in blue that you see is well recognized at this point with this high peak, that's uh, Omicron that happened a year ago, and that's SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you see that it has continued to uh, circulate and uh, it's not going away. We are seeing circulation levels right now that are not uh, below the lowest that we've ever had. They're continuing to, to increase actually. Uh, the red line is uh, your common rhinovirus. That has never gone away. And we do see that RSV, which is your yellow line, was gone for the first year after the pandemic in 2020 to 2021. And then it came back last year in the summer, which was unusual. And it has come back again this year in the summer. It is right now RSV, the highest um, uh, isolate, the most common virus isolated other than rhinovirus, which is always very high. And then you see influenza, which is the blue line, having a very steep rise. Again, after having no influenza for about a year, we started to see outbreaks of influenza, including uh, last winter and this summer, and then uh, almost circulation year round. But you see how, again, it has continued to peak. One point to make here is just that these are the three viruses that we focus on, but obviously there are others. And so there are people coming down with adenovirus, with human metanumovirus and the common cold, in addition to all of these viruses. So we have more than a tridemic, I would say, lots of viruses out there. We have seen the effect of these viruses in pediatric hospitalization and ICU admissions. This is also data from the CDC. And you see that overall, this is the same period from early 20, well, actually early 2022 to 2023, uh, 2020, November 2022. I'm sorry. So this is this year. You see that overall in the US, this entire year, there has been very high occupancy of uh, hospital beds and also ICU admissions. And in some regions, depending on where you are, there's actually been an increase in the common uh, recent time. So if you're specific Southwest, so for example, Rocky Mountain areas and Eastern uh, and Northeast areas are also rising. Um, this is a very interesting <laughs> figure here because, you know, we try to always 
see what the impact is. But when you look at hospitalizations, which is the tip of the iceberg in children up to age 17, you see that uh, during this season compared to pre prior seasons, um, you have influenza on the left and RSV on the right. We have already um, an estimate of 17.4 per 100,000 hospitalizations for flu. And this is early and high compared to prior seasons, except for before the pandemic at this point, right? So during the pandemic, we saw very little. But you see RSV, it's maybe around three or four times that number. It's really, really high. And it's also very early. So for children at this point, we're seeing both. But depending on where you are, RSV or flu could be the predominant. I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about hospitalizations because how different is this RSV season from prior ones? This RSV season here in terms of hospitalization rates is shown in the green uh, to the left. Uh, and you see during the pandemic at the bottom, the blue and the other green line are really low. But even compared to prior seasons, which is 2018 and 2019, you see that our hospitalization rate is early and is higher than it has been prior to the pandemic. This is overall all ages, just as comparing the seasons. When you compare now um, the rates of RSV hospitalization by age group, you have here um, the zero to four year old is this uh, line that I'm showing you in blue, is going to be the rate of hospitalization in the uh, children under five. So compared to the average, which is about 30.4 per 100,000 people, children can have twice as much, up to 60, and have had that already. And it seems to be coming down, actually, especially in some parts here in the South, where we are seeing some uh, decline. Other parts are just about to start seeing RSV. But again, compared to other age groups, the children under five are particularly affected. And this is where the tridemic is really affecting us, because I just put an insert here at the top uh, with COVID-19. And you see that since Omicron, the children six months to four years have actually become the ones that are more frequently hospitalized with COVID. And the same thing is true for influenza, which is the line at the, the, the figure at the bottom, where other than adults over 65 years of age, just like with uh, COVID, the children zero to four years of age are the ones that have the highest risk of hospitalization. So all three of these viruses circulating at the same time have a higher risk of uh, complications and hospitalization hospitalization in the youngest pediatric age group, the zero to four-year-olds. So um, let's see if I can go. Let's talk a little bit about RSV, just a brief summary. Uh, this is not a new virus. We know about it since the 1950s. It's usually was called a chimpanzee, chimpanzee coryza agent, uh, but it's a very common cause of lower respiratory tract disease in children, either bronchiolitis or pneumonia. We have two types of RSV virus. We have RSV A and RSV B, and they can cause winter outbreaks, okay? So this um, is very different from the other viruses. They tend to stay very, uh, uh, they don't change very much, very stable, A, A or B, but they both can be around. Uh, we have the greatest burden of disease in babies, but also young children and older adults can have uh, severe uh, lower respiratory tract disease. Recurrent infections can happen throughout life. And, uh, you know, you don't get, this means you don't get lifelong immunity even after you get RSV. You can get some uh, temporary immunity uh, after an infection, or you can have uh, immunity in young children from maternal internal antibodies or from passive antibodies that we administer, but we're basically susceptible throughout life. And although the neutralizing antibody that we make protects you, we, we continue to have um, potentially risk of infection. So the older you get though, and the more antibody you have, the less likelihood, lower likelihood that you can have lower respiratory tract illness. The impact in children of this virus is that, again, it is the most common cause of bronchiolitis or pneumonia in the very young children. Most children are infected by the age of two, and you can see that 30 to 40 percent do actually result in uh, bronchiolitis pneumonia syndrome, as opposed to just an upper respiratory illness. It has a higher rate of hospitalization than flu. Flu is about 1 percent. But for RSV is about two to 3% of infected children will require hospitalization. And that's what we've seen already um, in the data for this year. And about 75% of children with RSV who are hospitalized and have severe disease are actually previously healthy children and full-term children. So this is important to keep in mind because we will 
hear about the high-risk groups, we know, for example, that preterm babies can have severe disease, but there are more healthy full-term children and they can have more um, hospitalization. The mortality is twice as high as um, with influenza. And again, you can also have consequences later on with wheezing in these children. I want to just point out here the fact that, you know, we have uh, data from studies done many years ago. This is from Carolyn Hall, um, published in the 2013, but data for many years showing that, again, for RSV hospitalization, about 50% is going to happen in the first three months of life and about 70% in the first six months of life. And the reason is because these babies have a very uh, small lungs with narrow airways, and RSV causes a significant peribronchular inflammation that causes causes um, plugging, mucus plugging, and this is the, the wheezing and the bronchiolitis that we see. So there's a more recent study. This is from the new vaccine surveillance network that was published um, recently, but it covers the 2015-2016 season. And this is just to show you that it represents many uh, parts of the country. And um, we see the same thing. This is prior to the pandemic, of course. So it was a typical RSV season in the winter time. And you see the different rates of hospitalization, which are higher in younger children under two. But if you break it down to um, the under six month, you see that they have about 14.7 per, per, th per thousand, and the one-month-olds are even at the highest risk. And similar to what has been observed before, 67% of the children that were hospitalized under this network of over um, almost 3,000 children had no underlying conditions and had no history of preterm birth. And uh, this is from that same paper where you see, again, um, the breakdown of hospitalized children under two, uh, whether their gestational age was less than 29 weekers, which is one of the risk groups, of course, but the majority, and here we're talking about 80 plus percent, were 37 weeks or above, regardless of when they, they got uh, RSV. So that's important to keep in mind. So with that in mind, let's just talk about a patient that I had this fall so that we can start thinking about management of these cases. So this is a toddler, a 20 month old baby who was a 36 weeker and um, he was previously healthy. He had some nasal congestion, runny nose, a little bit of cough and some fever. So he came to see you. He came to this pediatrician um, after two days of symptoms. And uh, in terms of the history, the baby was an only child, but he did a 10-day care and he had received three doses of COVID vaccine. Uh, baby had also been vaccinated for flu. So just as a quick uh, poll of questions, um, what, what would you like to do in, uh, in the setting of your clinic if you had this patient? Um, you would not do any tests and send home with instructions to call if he worsens or test for flu and COVID and send home with instructions to call no testing and give bronchodilators and steroids or test for flu and then also treat with antivirals if possible bronchodilators and steroids or refer to the hospital right now. So there's a there's a window there that people can vote actually. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you can vote on the on the camera on the screen. All right. All right. All right. Wonderful. And this is again for the sake of discussion. So what you have said is you want to test for flu and COVID and then send home with instructions to call if the child worsens. I think this is actually quite appropriate. Um, and uh, again, this is uh, one of the, uh, just to poll the group uh, in this era with the tridemic, we do want to know if this child has flu and COVID. I think that sounds like a very good approach. And, um, you know, um, this, this child, uh, I'll tell you the story, uh, was actually sent home, um, but no testing was done. <laughs> and so I think that you chose the right one, by the way, because we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, um, about treatment at this stage, but symptomatic care seems to be the most appropriate approach. And especially if you already know that they don't have uh, influenza or COVID, because you could treat, of course, for influenza. So let's see if I can go to the next one. So this, this, Pediatrician opted not to test. The child looked pretty good, but they went ahead and sent him home on supportive care and did ask them to call if they had any more symptoms. Um, three days later, the baby did develop increased work of breathing and um, actually was and ended up in their emergency room. And there he got tested uh, for COVID and was found to be positive for COVID. 
you see the saturations were 90% under mayor and chest retractions were noted. And the chest X-ray is what you see there with some uh, perihilar infiltrates. So now I think we're going more to the urgent care side. And so let's see how comfortable you feel about that. You're probably saying, see, you should have tested him for COVID ahead of time, but maybe there would have been not much that we could have done um, because we really have limited options to treat COVID at this, at this age. But um, what do you think we should do next? And um, you want to admit the child? and just give them oxygen and that's it, uh, or admit for oxygen and also give antibiotics because you're worried about an, a bacterial pneumonia. Uh, also, number three, do those and steroids. And number four, all of those and albuterol. Or maybe you need more information before making decisions. I'll let you go ahead and vote. Wonderful. Okay. This is great. So the number one choice was to admit for oxygen support only. Um, some of you said also give antibiotics, some of you said also give steroids, some of you said also give albuterol, and some wanted to get more information, and so this is interesting because I did point out, and this doesn't mean that this is the right thing to do, but you know, for the sake of discussion, this is one of the it, this is really what happened. The child was only tested for COVID. I think that like some of you, I would have wanted to get a little bit more information, maybe tests for flu and RSV at this time, right? That, will, that would have been maybe something to do. But um, things are done differently in different places. So what happened um, with this child is that he was admitted, he needed to be admitted, but no testing, additional testing was done in the emergency room. Um, they felt that this was COVID and um, started the baby on a, a high flow nasal cannula to keep saturations over 95. Actually, this baby was started on ampicillin, dexamethasone, and albuterol. I have to say, if you think it's COVID, I guess dexamethasone is appropriate. Um, now, I don't know much, you know, if uh, the ampicillin or albuterol would have been necessary at that point, but um, this is what was done, you know, a very broad approach in the emergency room. On hospital day two, though, this baby actually got sicker and had more respiratory distress. Fever was gone at this point, but had more secretions, started, had to get some more support with a nasal BiPAP, never needed to be intubated, remained, you know, on a, on a acuity floor, but, but not um, in the ICU. So what do we do now? <laughs> Do we get more tests at this point? Do we change the antibiotics? Do we start remdesivir because we think it's COVID? Do we do all of that or just continue the current care that we're giving and, and stay put? Wonderful, okay. Yes, I, I gave you a hint of that. So I guess if you're if you're asking for additional testing, you're thinking like uh, we should, you know, there's COVID out there. Um, we are seeing co-infections with COVID and flu and RSV. Um, maybe this is not just COVID, right? And you're already given the support that you need. The kid is actually getting sicker after a couple of days. Something else is going on. So indeed, you know, please remember that we're in a tertiary care hospital. <laughs> so this happened for real. Uh, that eventually, actually, he did get more testing, but they also started treatment for remdesivir. Be with remdesivir, because of the positive COVID, they switched the antibiotics from ampicillin to ceftriaxone. And the tests that were ordered show that there was a high white count, blood cultures and urine cultures were negative. But sure enough, RSV was detected and flu was negative. So this is not the baby, this is a picture from the internet, but this is what a baby like this would look like potentially. Um, and the point that I wanted to make with this case, and we can discuss a little bit more later, is that we're in a different era. We have to be thinking about these different viruses at this point. And um, maybe here people were thinking so much about COVID and we've seen so much COVID that you know we forgot about the others. But there's no question with the current epidemiology that we've reviewed that there is, we have to think about flu now. We have to think about RSV even in the summertime because we're seeing so much RSV uh, at different times of the year. So this baby had a very typical biphasic illness with RSV where you have initially a URI type symptoms, maybe with fever or not. And then you do develop the lower respiratory tract disease with some worsening x-ray findings, oxygen saturations that drop, and then you need to be supported for RSV. Uh, 
I cannot fault them for trying to treat for the COVID-19 because it was a co-infection and we have seen some recent data that co-infections uh, might result in actually a more um, a worse uh, uh, outcome. So I'm going to go briefly through some of the guidance that we have. The CDC has this in their website and it says, most RSV infections go away on their own within a week or two. There's no specific treatment recommended. So if you are uh, see looking for information, you know, you'll see that they'll say just manage the fever and the pain, drink a lot of fluids, observe, and they do say to people call your healthcare professional if your child is having trouble breathing, not enough uh, drinking and um, worsening symptoms. So this is what the general approach is. And, you know, you'll see that for it, this is true. Most most children will recover on their own, even though there's a higher rate of, of hospitalization, but you just need to be aware of the symptoms. This is the guidance uh, of management for RSV from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is the guidance for bronchiolitis in general that was published in 2014. And uh, you see, um, this is what we have uh, at this point based on the evidence that has been available. So it's almost 10 years old, um, but the diagnosis for RSV, uh, they recommend to do it based on history and clinical evaluation. They recommend to consider risk factors such as prematurity, young children, and chronic lung and heart disease, and that labs, maybe even the testing and radiographic evidence is not routinely recommended. You know, I would think that um, if you're just observing at home and you already tested for flu and COVID, which is things that we can test for uh, efficiently and uh, you can actually treat in some cases, um, maybe it's not necessary to treat for RSV as if you think that's a clinical picture of bronchiolitis. But if you're having somebody in the hospital already, I, I would have a bias to, to wanting to treat for sure. So maybe that's part of what we saw here. Treatment options though are really not uh, supported by evidence at this point. So uh, what you all, all of you said in terms of supportive care is what we need to do based on this guidance. Uh, butyrol, epinephrine, hypertonic saline, steroids, even antibiotics are not recommended for RSV bronchiolitis. If you think that there could be a secondary infection, you can do antibiotics. And um, I want to just point out that this guidance is based on uh, first episode of wheezing, that is bronchiolitis, right? Uh, IV fluids, yes, and these are all strong recommendations. And the guidance even says you may choose not to check pulse ox and administer oxygen supplementation as long as the sets are greater than 90%. But again, this is a clinical judgment and this is a weak recommendation. So um, the bronchodilators, I'll just briefly tell you here, are not routinely recommended. And this is some of the evidence that was used for that guidance. The Cochrane review of more than 30 clinical trials. It's not a big number of children, almost 2000 children with bronchiolitis, but again, first time wheezing. And this is both in the outpatient and the inpatient settings. And in these trials, there was really no effect identified of bronchodilators on the oxygen saturation, on children who were hospitalized, no benefit either. And um, they did not seem to reduce the need for hospital hospitalization when they were treated outpatient or uh, shorten the length of stay in the hospital when they were treated inpatient or the length of the disease when they were treated at home. So this is some of the basis of why these recommendations are in place. Uh, when they look specifically on uh, albuterol, they still couldn't see any effects. And the conclusion is that the bronchodilators were not helpful in the management of bronchiolitis. Steroids, ribavirin, this is another review that was done, another systematic review that supported this guidance was from Medline and the Cochrane Review, data from two decades, uh, the 80s to 2002, 44 randomized clinical trials looking at inpatient and outpatient, and again, little evidence to support these drugs in treating patients with first episode bronchiolitis usually. Um, and one of the questions here that is brought up in this review even is that many of these studies, however, are underpowered and few studies really are consistent with, with some of the outcomes. So there is a need for larger studies that are going to be looking at these questions uh, hopefully in the future. So I just want to show you the data and then give you a quick overview about options because antivirals, unfortunately, are not readily available, but vaccines and monoclonal antibodies is what we have. 
So this is a big list. I don't mean for you to look at it, but I just wanted to show you that a lot of research is going on. What says fusion inhibitors and other mechanisms, all of those are antivirals that are being looked at, and none of them has, has made it to clinical uh, availability. They're usually tested in adults who are older or people who have underlying problems, but we don't really have an option for an antiviral. Ribavirin is quite expensive. It's not necessarily as effective as one would think, so it's really restricted to uh, high-risk populations. So what about prevention? Palivizumab, going also back with the 2014 AP recommendations, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, recommended for children less than 29 weeks uh, prematurity, and that would be in their first and second season, and then, um, I'm sorry, in their first RSV season, uh, but if they have chronic lung disease, they could have it in their second season, just like uh, children with heart disease can have as well. And then this is some additional groups, uh, you know, immunocompromised patients, those with neuromuscular anomalies um, can have cardiac transplant patients may potentially be able to recommend palivizumab. This is important though. Um, in general, the guidance on when to use palivizumab is based on the circulation of RSV. And uh, we know that there's been an abnormal circulation. So it's okay to use it outside of the standard season as long as there is circulation. And this flexible approach has been supported by the AP. I wanted to just very briefly, because I want to make sure we have a discussion. I just the future is bright though. Um, this is a list that is uh, showing you different phases of development of products like live attenuated protein based nucleic acid and recombinant vector vaccines that are in development, as well as other options for passive prophylaxis. So, in addition to palivizumab, having uh, long acting monoclonal antibodies is going to be an option in the near future. And uh, probably um, most important part is that we don't have pediatric vaccines yet. But maternal RSV vaccines have been in development for many years, since the late 1990s. And while there was one that made it to a phase three trial by this company called Novavax, did not meet their uh, primary efficacy endpoint. Now we have another uh, product from uh, Pfizer that has completed a phase three trial or is going going phase three trial. And what I was going to show you, this is just shared in November that this vaccine given to pregnant women has shown an efficacy of nearly 82% in, in, in decreasing severe medically attended lower respiratory tract illness due to RSV in babies in the first three months of life and up to 70% in the first six months of life. So this vaccine uh, given to moms during pregnancy could be an option next year, as early as next year for a future RSV season. And so it could make a big difference. And then for prevention, um, this is just another point here that um, we have also um, monoclonal antibodies that are long acting, meaning you don't have to give them every month. You can do it one administration for the entire season. They can last uh, at least um, five months and then you can prevent RSV. And the goal of these is not just to focus on the very preterm babies less than 29 weeks, but actually 29 to 35 week preemies, children with underlying conditions, and also full term healthy children that could potentially benefit from these. So the top three uh, there on this list are potentially also uh, soon to be available completing phase three trials. That's what I wanted to share with you. Um, this is something we can discuss at some point that, to give you just the idea that one of the big uh, debates next year is going to be, do we vaccinate pregnant women or do we give the passive antibodies to the babies? And they both have their advantages and their challenges. But uh, the good news is that we have options and that this is closer to um, a reality than unfortunately antivirals would be. But prevention and the reason to continue to vaccinate and inform people about uh, prevention strategies is going to be critical. So I will stop there and thank you for your attention this morning with the hope that we can further continue to talk about RSV. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> Thanks, great summary. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Sagar. Yes, thank you. So we're going to move to our panel discussion. So I'm gonna invite all of our panelists uh, to turn their cameras on so we can get started. So first of all, I feel like there's a disclaimer I need to say, I'm an adult internal medicine physician and I am very much aware that pediatric patients are not tiny adults, right? Like a very different physiology. So one of the questions I wanted to ask and perhaps each of you could share your experiences, how are you seeing 
RSV, COVID and influenza with the New York practices are in the hospital. And um, I guess I'm going to go across the board and start with Dr. Dudas and Dr. Parodi, Dr. Walsh and Dr. Fahim. Good morning. Um, yeah, I, I mostly practice outpatient pediatrics and um, we are, I think, um, uh, we, we are seeing just a ton of respiratory patients coming in and we're seeing a small portion of them. We're having a huge number call or send us messages. This is, I think, the first season that our patients have really had the ability to reach out by uh, portal message and we are I would say a little bit um, feeling of overwhelmed, if if nothing else, by by the amount of respiratory um, disease out there. Um, so we're doing our best to see them. Um, we're doing a lot of respiratory clinics. Uh, we're trying to work on some rapid access clinics for respiratory care, and we're really trying to do our best to to help keep our patients out of urgent care and the emergency department if they don't need to be there because. Um, our local ER is seeing about 300% of their normal volume, so they're quite overwhelmed. Wow, that's incredible. Dr. Pararodi, did you want to add something to it? Uh, our experience in the Southwest, I'm in Phoenix, uh, is pretty similar. I think uh, uh, we definitely have been seeing co-infections uh, with uh, COVID and flu and RSV and and COVID and flu and RSV. And I think I, I've even had a case where there was all three. Um, and and I do practice mostly in the ambulatory care setting. I also see newborns. Uh, we've had moms coming in sick and we're trying to protect the babies, you know, by having moms like wear a mask. It worked during COVID and we're trying to go back to, you know, the, like the mask worked. Uh, so at least, um, you know, yesterday I saw a baby with viral symptoms and I did testing in the office and everything was negative, but the baby had been around a cousin who was coughing over the weekend. And uh, I gave some guidance. The baby was smiling. It was a three week old and uh, already smiling, <laughs> looked great. But I told, you know, a lot can happen in the next uh 24 to 72 right. hours. So you need to keep a close eye on the baby. Call us in the morning if you think the baby looks worse so we can see the baby again. Um, you know, and keep your baby well hydrated. I think, uh, you know, the basics are really, really important, which, uh, you know, when we admit to the hospital, we usually start some IV fluids, but keeping a baby well hydrated uh, can go a long way uh, mm -hmm. to, to help prevent deterioration and just a lot of education on recognizing signs and symptoms of uh, distress. Mm -hmm. um, most parents don't notice there's distress until the baby isn't feeding well. So I usually hone in on that symptom, uh, little baby, because they're just like looking at the at the outside of the baby, and uh, and you know just okay. th that's that's what we're trying to do yeah. is uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and one other thing, I I'm really big about positioning the way they feed the baby. Um, it, I think it's really important to feed the baby like as upright as possible. Uh, there's uh, some really tiny studies that suggest that there can be, especially if they're coughing and breathing faster, a little bit more risk of aspiration. Um, and so I, and that's always like a risk with any baby, but I really uh, make that part mm -hmm. of my anticipatory guidance. Right. That's, that's great, right? So giving a lot of support and guidance to the parents or the caregiver of that really tiny little life in front of you. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Dr. Walsh, I wanted to ask from you, especially as somebody who's in a leadership position, right? So many people will be coming to you with questions. And one of the things we were talking about earlier with Dr. Munoz, and I would actually love for Dr. Munoz to chime in here too, is like, how do you sort of answer the question as a leader that says, I feel like I have to do something. I know there's not enough data, but I need to do something. Like, how, what do you do when, when that happens? Well, I mean, I, I still think it's really important for us to continue to practice medicine based on evidence, right? So continue to using evidence-based practices, you know, for parents, especially because we're, we're in a similar boat as as, as Dr. Dudas and Dr. Pararodi, we're just seeing, we're being inundated with 
with um, illness. And um, we are testing um, and, you know, primarily looking at supportive care. Most of these diseases, other than influenza, if you catch in the first 48 hours, it's supportive care. It's supportive care outpatient. It's supportive care in the hospital. And so, you know, I had a mom who said, I want my child to go into the hospital because I'm worried they're going to get worse. Well, there isn't anything we're going to do in the hospital that you can't do at home to begin mm-hmm. with. And so just trying to reassure the families. I think there's a couple of really important things to be paying attention to, though. There's still a lot of families who want to do telemedicine visits for these patients with colds. And I am a firm believer in that we need to actually see these patients in person, make sure their oxygen saturation is okay, listen to their lungs, make because parents, you know, with a with a video visit, it's very difficult sometimes unless they're having significant respiratory stress to really know what's going on. You can't do any testing. So um, bringing these patients in, laying our eyes on these patients, really, re- and the families are so reassured when they, you've actually examined their baby. We're also seeing a fair amount of co-infection with ear infections. Can't do that over a telemedicine visit. So seeing these patients as best we can in person, um, reassuring the families that there's been many studies done that show that there's lots of medicines we can give, like albuterol, it's just going to make your child's heart race, and it's not going to really help their symptoms. Um, I also focus on um, chest percussions and teaching parents how to sit their babies upright and do chest per- percussions because many kids who get mucus plugs and things have difficulty, especially small mm-hmm. infants, in in expelling um, those mucus plugs. So using vaporizer, humidifiers, doing a warm, hot, steamy shower, um, and then doing chest percussions to see if you can't augment and getting some of those mucus plugs out. So uh, that's that's what I kind of focus on on these patients. And testing another sure great tip. <laughs> another great tip from, from all these are leaders of pediatrics. Dr. Munoz, before I move to Dr. Fahim, I wanted to ask you to comment, especially you being like an evidence-based guru, right, in this space, how do you counsel, because you're going through multiple communities trying to reassure, educate, reassure, educate, how do you approach it? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's very difficult, and I have to say um, I have a lot of respect for um, the pediatricians, the providers who are at the front line, because they are seeing the children, they're seeing the anxiety of the parents, and they also know that the emergency rooms are busy. You don't want to send a child there because, you know, they can get exposed to other things and the hospitals are really overwhelmed at this point. So you want to do the best that you can to keep them home and to be able to uh, get this child through their illness. And I think that, um, you know, this is why some of these cases illustrate things. One needs to understand the disease well. So for example, RSV is known to be a biphasic illness, right? And so we we need to make sure that parents are aware of that so that they're not too overly concerned. And if they expect that if things are going to get worse before they get better, then you will be there to to give them what they need, the support Mm -hmm. that they need. Uh, Some of the, uh, the hydration, the propping, you know, all of these things that has been discussed. I also think that um, we have tools though. We have tools for diagnosis, right? And so um, we have the ability to treat young children with flu. And so if you know that flu is circulating in your community and that is something that you could potentially treat in young children as young as two weeks of age and very early life. So you you would want to maybe take care of that and you can do it. And then um, there's not much we can do for testing for COVID, I'm sorry, for, treating COVID in this age group, unfortunately, but also having the knowledge that you have this infection is helpful because you could potentially, depending on high risk, have interventions like treating with with remdesivir, which is the only thing we have. But in addition to that, being aware that these three viruses are so common right now that this constant communication with the family is going to be critical so that you can guide them through the next steps. Those are those are great tips and, and processes of how to think about it and what the families need from each of you. I wanted to ask Dr. Fahim, you know, you have a unique perspective too, as being on the inpatient and ambulatory side of things, specifically on the inpatient, what are you guys seeing? And especially um, I think yesterday's CDC MMWR commented on 
hospitalizations in this age group with flu and COVID and now RSV. So floor is yours. Yeah, <laughs> so agree with all of the above. <laughs> um, we, I mean, pretty much we've been seeing what, what all the graphs have been showing. Um, there's been an increased amount of um, RSV hospitalizations, particularly um, a several of them also with concomitant flu, rhinovirus, um, human metanumovirus, we've been seeing a lot of when we do our whole um, respiratory mm -hmm. viral panel, those are also coming back positive. So a lot of these kids being um, hit with double, double viruses at the same time. Um, kind of what I've been seeing personally is a lot of, you know, older sibs that are going to preschool and daycare and then the new baby kind of gets exposed. And that's, that's primarily a lot of um, the hospitalization that's, that's been happening is that those infants are kind of coming in on that peak of illness um, on anywhere from day three to day six, um, requiring that extra um, respiratory support. Um, on that outpatient side, um, education, um, that's what I think is primarily the key, especially really um, explaining to parents that, you know, what to look for on these, on the, that day four, day five of illness and um, kind of, I'm pulling up YouTube videos. These are what retractions look like. These are, this is what okay. looks like. So I've been spending I mean, almost double the appointment time, just kind of really honing in on if you need any, if you're seeing any of these things, call us or go straight to the ER. Um, hydration, that propping up, um, a lot of suctioning, a lot of that steam humidification sort of supportive care. Um, and then generally what, you know, with, with, I have those diligent parents that are just really, really on top of um, hand washing, their older sibs or the older children. And, and that's, that's really been helpful hand washing, mask wearing. Um, I've been noticing that, that they've been able to kind of minimize the, the severity of illness and their little, little, littler right. babies and helping that as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think all of everything that's been mentioned, we've been, we've been trying to really push hard. <laughs> Dr. Greenswag, I uh, wanted to know your thoughts and have you chime in. Wonderful conversation and I have lots of questions, but I'll just ask one. Could you, uh, Dr. Munoz, talk about, is there downstream sequelae from RSV? So what, what do we have to worry about with these kids when they get better and grow up? Right. So that is one of the concerns with RSV. You know, in and of itself, it is a illness that can wheeze. Um, not all babies with RSV wheeze, but it can be a wheezing illness. And um, if you get RSV very early in life, um, it has been observed that some of these children with other recurrent infections, or even if it's a different virus, then some of these children might have a tendency to wheeze uh, in the future as well. So, um, this is one of the aspects that has been evaluated in a number of studies, um, whether reducing um, the risk of having an early life RSV infection could also impact that um, late wheezing uh, and chronic wheezing episodes. And some data have shown that that it, it could be possible, right? So, but it is something that with the contribution of so many other viruses, it's going to be very difficult to really uh, hone in and say, this is just RSV because other viruses can do the same thing. But it would help just because of how, how more frequent RSV is compared to the others, especially in those first six to 12 weeks of life, right? And so if we could prevent that and have an impact on secondary bacterial infections, which is also a problem, and then recurrent um, wheezing or recurrent uh, risk for uh, other infections, uh, viral infections is going to be very helpful. You know, other than that, um, I think that um, there has really, uh, the, the main concern is, is having children make it through that first illness um, when they're very little, and which is why they need support because babies can't breathe through their nose, as you know, right? So they plugged up their nose. They also have tight 
chest. And that's what ends being uh, the risk mm -hmm. of apneas yes. and having to go in the hospital. But once they're older and they get their first RSV illness, maybe in their second year of life, some of those events are not going to happen. And potentially the risk of having recurring wheezing in the future is going to be low. This mm -hmm. is why, again, this early intervention with uh, maternal vaccination, so you don't get yes. RSV in the first six months or with palivizumab or other monoclonal antibodies is really buying time and pull, pushing that to a later age. Great. Um, I think we're coming up on the top of the art. This has just been a great hour and I think a learning for all of us, the, the case example is great. And I think the information is great. And everyone needs to keep their hand away from the pen when they want to start ordering albuterol and steroids. So I, I got that message really clearly. Uh, but really, thank you so much. And to the panelists as well. Dr. Sagar, any last uh, comments? I uh, just a very big thank you for the panel, Dr. Munoz, but also our frontline folks who yes. are dealing with this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And yes. um, I think John had sent a message saying we'll share the slides as well as we have an update to the COVID guidelines from mm -hmm. PE and that we will be sharing later this afternoon. Can I just uh, put a plug into what Dr. Munoz said earlier about the AAP and those videos that potentially could be seen um, by our, our physicians who care for pediatric patients. Um, Dr. Munoz, could you share with us what those are again? Yes, absolutely. So the American Academy of Pediatrics is also concerned with this surge and also with our pediatricians uh, at the front line. And so we have heard um, their concerns and uh, education is available through this ECHO project. Uh, I share the information uh, with the group here so they can provide it to you. These are sessions that happen every Tuesday um, at 11 a.m. my time and central time, but you know, depending on where you are, and that are meant to actually have this type of discussions. What are people able to do to resolve the issues that they're seeing in the community? I have heard, for example, that um, being able to provide that oxygen support uh, in the clinic or in outpatient settings so that you don't have to end up having to send the babies to the emergency room might be one option that some places are, are exploring or are being able to implement. And this is going to be very practical discussions about that, how to manage these children with multiple infections or one of these infections in the community. So I would encourage you to, to participate if you can or review, you know, listen to the information or videos at your own time. Sounds great. So uh, this is our last uh, clinical update grand rounds for 2022. And we are, uh, we're at or rapidly approaching the end of the year and the holiday season. And so uh, for all of you, um, safe travels during the holiday season, uh, hopeful for time off and time with friends and family and um, loved ones and being safe and not getting RSV, COVID or the flu. So with, with that, thank you. I, it's been a great morning. Dr. Munoz, fabulous panel. Thank you, John and Brooke. Thanks for pulling all this together and Dr. Sagar. So have a great rest of the week and next week as well.